Chapter 8, 1905. After another three years, Alfred passes these editors, engravers and engineers and this bird who has a broken wing. He passes this mouse, magpie and mule and arrives at his Sunday school whilst his mother begins to sing. Whilst her spine stands her to attention with a steely sort of tension like a regal sort of king. She is wearing her Sunday best, Sunday vest and Sunday bling. The year is 1905. A South African miner is unearthed from the largest diamond ever to be found. An American child is inventing ice lollies near his favourite playground. And a German physicist is publishing the equation E equals MC squared. In Norway and Sweden there is a process of dissolution. In Russia there is a process of revolution. And in Australia a new tennis grand slam is being prepared. Whilst the British return from Tibet where they have been a threat then call for conscription to be declared. But Alfred is only focused on this church, this silver birch and this litter of newly born kittens. He is dressed in a tunic, tabard and tie, trousers which hug each thigh and a pair of woollen mittens. He normally feels at home in this church where he sits near an engraved set of stones, a crucified Christ with protruding bones and some icons which hang down from the bleachers, some gothic gargoyles which are covered in gothic boils and some columns which are covered in creepers, some people in shiny shoes, some shiny pews and some zealous preachers. He normally smiles at a farmer's daughter who reads a book, a maid who stands in a crook, and a frowsy dressmaker, a wheezy choir master, a sneezy pastor, and a drowsy caretaker. But in a move which Alfred finds cruel, he is taken into his Sunday school, which bird tweets and at baby wails. He finds himself in this hollow church hall, which is tarny, tarnished, and tall, full of his ants and full of those snails. Where his wishbone arches support that ceiling, this pale paint is peeling and this air smells of charity cake sales. He sits with Bernie and starts to pray, but he's not allowed to play as he falls for this woman with kiwi eyes. As he falls for her flowing dress, her gentle finesse, her slender legs and her slender thighs. Alfred's infatuation with a Sunday school teacher grows each week, but without the courage to speak, he has to imagine what she is really like. So he imagines a genial, gentle and gracious ideal. He imagines that she is his for real and he imagines that they are alike. When she calls him sweetie, Alfred thinks that she finds him sweet. When she calls him love bug, that she loves him and is just being discreet. And when she calls him cutie pie, it makes him gleam. When she calls him angel, pumpkin or dovey, cupcake, chicken or lovey, it encourages him to dream. He dreams about her flirtatious winking, unconscious blinking and dimple making, her foot shuffling, hair ruffling and bottom shaking. He dreams about her slender arms, pleasant charms and spangly brooches. He dreams about her kiwi eyes and her silky thighs as each new Sunday approaches. As each new Sunday comes and each new Sunday goes, whilst Alfred gleams, glimmers and glows during lessons which are full of honest lies, which are full of stories about a devil who sups with a long spoon, a man who lives on the moon and heaven which is up in the skies. His Sunday school teacher is not deliberately deceptive, deliberately unreceptive or deliberately misleading. But she turns to fabrication to compensate for her lack of education and to make her lessons seem pleasing. Alfred does not utter a single word or any sound which can be heard until today's lesson on the commandment, thou shalt not kill. When he finds his teacher so radiant, righteous and right, brilliant, beautiful and bright, that he feels a colossal thrill. If someone wants to kill you, he says while she starts dimple making and bottom shaking near that window sill, let them. If they strike you on one cheek, Offer them your other cheek too. And if they steal your coat, offer them your jumper. My darlings, you should love and pray for your enemies as if they're your very own bubbers. Alfred finds this lesson so ethereal, saintly, seraphic and surreal that he questions his father's wars in distant forests and distant lands. He thinks his father would have defended himself from attack and fought his enemies back using his head, heart and hands. But he cannot be sure because his mother does not talk about his father's time at war when he followed his leader's commands. Was the daddy very good at fighting? Alfred once asked her. You really are going positively quick, my little soldier. His mother had started to slur. But, 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 but please tell me, did, 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 did daddy ever hurt anyone? You'll be just as tall as him, my wonderful warrior. Oh, just look at you. Look at how you've grown. Just look at the white cliffs of Dover. But, 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 but please tell me, did daddy ever kill anyone else's daddy? But, but, but pretty please, pretty please with a cherry on top. Oh, 
you'll be just like him, by terrific trooper. Somewhere, somewhere, somehow, you shall, you shall, you shall. So with his affections undiminished, after his lesson has finished, Alfred finally approaches his bow. His brow turns wet with salty sweat, which makes his forehead glow. I lo- lo- love the lesson, he says, with nerves which clearly show. But I do have one question. Please tell me, if it's wrong to kill other people, and if we should love our enemies, does that mean that soldiers are b- 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 bad? Does that mean that my d- 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 daddy has gone to hell? I'd be ever so grateful if you tell me. I'd be very much obliged. Sunday school teacher begins foot shuffling and hair ruffling before she takes a moment to think. Before she squats down to Alfred's height, flushes white and flushes pink. I knew your daddy, he says as she puts down her milky drink. He didn't strike me as someone who killed another person. Not all soldiers are killers, Snuggle Bunny. They can secure peace treaties and trade agreements too. They can even liberate people, like your daddy did in West Africa. Alfred is keen to find out more than this girl who he does adore, acclaim, appreciate and admire. He wants to stay here and be near to this girl who he desires. But please tell me more, he asks whilst he perspires. Please, please, please. Okay, angel face, you've got me, his Sunday school teacher replies without even thinking, and Mrs. Cheeky winking and Miss Unconscious blinking. Well, your daddy, it must have been about nine years ago now, was sent to civilise the Ashanti. Their leader had been a naughty boy. He'd forgotten to pay us a peace tax and he'd traded his nation's wealth for weapons. His army had become really strong, just like you, Freddykins. Well, Peanut, if I didn't scare your daddy one bit, he was happy to lead an expedition to the Ashanti capital on a mission to win that nation over, bring it into the British Empire and save it from the baddies who wanted to steal their gold. Now your daddy knew that his troops could be more intelligent, respectable and strong than the Ashanti. But he also knew that they could get hurty-worty and he was keen to protect his brothers who were already suffering from yucky illnesses because of the icky, sticky heat. So, Sugar Plum, your daddy's troop pitched their tents in the forest above the Ashanti capital where they were hidden by coconut palms, rubber trees and colourful orchids. They made plans whilst they ate their dindins. Once his friends were snug and snoring, your daddy snuck off into the woods. He found every single hornet's nest in that forest and carefully cut them all down. So soft was your daddy's touch that he didn't arouse a single one of those fluffy, wuffy bugs. Well, sweetness, once his cart contained hundreds of nests and millions of hornets, your daddy crept into the Ashanti capital. He attached his nest along the inside of a city wall which is nearest to the British camp, smiled and went to bed he buys. The next morning, the Ashanti capital was noisy woisy. The heathen temples rang out with their call to prayer. Chuk chucks crowed, woof woofs barked and traders scurried off to market. Well, Poppet, those teeny weeny hornets didn't like that noise at all. It made them crossy wossy. They left their nests and they started to fly. But they found their new surroundings as odd as cod because their forest had turned into a town with rows of houses instead of rows of trees. So, with the city wall blocking the way behind, they flew into the Ashanti capital itself. Well, honey pie, when the townsfolk saw a swarm of hornets descending upon them, they were struck with fear and thrown into confusion. Those silly billies and all their moo-moos, nays and barbars ran right away. They left their capital completely empty. And, after searching high and low, your daddy found the Ashanti's leader, arrested him and made him sign a treaty which brought the Ashanti lands into the British Empire. So you see, sweet cheeks, your daddy was a real hero. He made our empire even greater than it was before without ever breaking the Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not kill. And he loved his enemy too, because he would improve the lives of the Ashanti people by replacing their naughty leader with a super duper British viceroy. Alfred starts to smile, because he is enraptured by the Sunday school teacher's style which he finds incredibly delicious. And he leaves his Sunday school, convinced that his father was not cruel, mean, malevolent or malicious. Thank you, he says, as he becomes repetitious. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're awesome, 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 awesome. You make me feel like I'm on top of the world. World, world, world. As a result of the story he has just been told, Alfred's confidence increases fourfold, which encourages him to woo. He gives his Sunday school teacher some blue seashells, some blue bells and this card which is pale blue. He gives her some flapjacks made out of oats. 
he brushes up against the coats and he writes her some love notes too. He writes that he loves her beautiful smile, loves her beautiful style and loves her beautiful feet. He blows her kisses during class and strokes her ass whenever they happen to meet. At first, his Sunday school teacher finds this bonnie bewitching and bliss. Then she considers it something to discard, disregard and dismiss before she finally accepts that it is a wry, abnormal and a miss. And so she stops her flirtatious winking, unconscious blinking and dimple making, her foot shuffling, hair ruffling and bottom shaking. But Alfred believes that he is acting like his stepfather when he courted his mother, like one grown up or any other. And so he continues on. He gives his Sunday school teacher even more notes, brushes up against her coats and sings her a romantic song. Until he meets this man who has a pair of red socks which look like antiques and a pair of red cheeks which make him look wild. This man snaps his forefinger and thumb, which turns Alfred dumb like an introverted sort of child. I just so happen to be the Sunday school's superintendent, he says in a voice which sounds disturbed, perturbed and wild. And I think you should know, I just so happen to be your Sunday school teacher's husband. I just so happen to be very protective of her. As Alfred learns that his Sunday school teacher is married, he becomes harried with a shady case of the blues. This revelation stops his flirtation in its tracks as he changes into his slacks and into his everyday shoes. Before he walks with his mother past these trees which are covered in plums, these slums and that thicket, those buzzing bees, wobbly trees and amateur game of cricket. This afternoon country walk and the superintendent's talk help Alfred to clear his mind. They help him to leave his childhood infatuation and his childhood frustration far behind. And they help him to bounce back strong as he skips along and gets involved in a new school week as he manages his inner urges and his emotive surges which evolve towards a peak. He sits with a snotty-nosed scamp who has a hairy ear and the tallest boy in his year here in their new classroom where the authoritative teacher starts to whinge, cringe and fume. The authoritative teacher is wearing a studded collar and a studded shirt, a bowler hat which is splattered with dirt and a pair of laced up boots. He has a penchant for swishing his rattanwood cane to inflict some pain and end his countless disputes. He loves to swish his rattanwood cane whilst he sometimes looks inane and whilst he sometimes looks excited. Whilst he taunts, you'll never use the test tubes. Get away from those cubes and don't speak unless you've been invited. He swishes the arm of any child who answers him back, whose posture is slack, who arrives here slightly late, before he makes him sit in the corridor alone and sends a letter home to spread his boundless hate. The authoritative teacher is ever so easily distracted, he touches anything to which he is attracted, whilst he swishes his rattanwood cane. He touches these clipboards, these dangling cords, and that pot which is full of fresh rain, this torn up book, this curvy hook, and that tinted window pane. Which is why he stops his class, fiddles with this glass, and swishes his rattanwood cane. It is why he points at this map and touches his cap before he tries to explain. This is the empire on which a sun never sets, he dictates from a book with this baffled look which is insipid, imbecilic and inane. A gift from God. It shows that we're what they call the Lord's chosen people, fighting God's holy wars, spreading his Bible, civilising the evens and so on. Replacing the queer cultures, religions and politics of idolatrous savages with British ways, intelligent, respectable and strong British ways. God is grateful for it. We're acting in his holy name. God, he mutters. Empire. Gift. Alfred knows better than to debate, dispute or disagree, because he knows it would make his teacher angry, which would make him start to holler. The authoritative teacher is already jealous of the way Alfred amazed his elders just last year, as if he was a real teacher here, and not just another scholar. That event caused the authoritative teacher to fill with discontent, which has inspired Alfred to dissent, riot, revolt and rebel. He shouted, when he should not have been talking. He skipped when he should not have been walking and he ignored his teachers as well. So Alfred's angst, anxiety and agitation, fury, fretfulness and frustration have all began to swell. Whilst his teacher swishes his cane, mutters again and fiddles with his bell. Heathens, savages, barbarians. Alfred listens and wants to disagree, but he does not feel free or in control. So he watches his teacher look away, fiddle with some hay, candy, card and coal. 
Alfie sneaks around this exposed piece of cable, runs towards his teacher's table and grabs his teacher's book. He throws it into this fire, this flaming pyre, and returns without a second look. The authoritative teacher swishes his rattlewood cane, fiddles with this model of a brain and this piece of salted bacon. He fiddles with this piece of chalk and that piece of cork before he sees that his book has been taken. What damn insolence! He yells like a bully. What ingratitude! He yelps ungracefully. What sin! He yells disdainfully. Ye lot make my toothache. Don't ye think you'll get away with this? And so on. To dash it. Oh no, 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 no. Ye fousies all be ashamed of yourselves. There's no more on in ye than there is in a rotten potato. Insolence, he mutters. Ingratitude. Potatoes. His narrow teeth grind inside his narrow head, which flashes rose, ruby and red, whilst his belly begins to quake, whilst he fiddles with his chalk, this stalk and that steak. Ye must act responsibly, children, he cries with furious eyes as his body begins to shake. You must believe in personal responsibility and personal everything, because right now ye are as far from the right sort as one could imagine, the whole lot of ye, and ye shan't leave here till the culprit is found. My life upon it! You shan't play during break or leave the home until after the blight of responsible for this abomination sallies forth. To sally forth now! Responsibility, he mutters. Blighters. Ohm. But no one says a word. No sound is heard and no comment is slurred. Very well then, the authoritative teacher says whilst he fiddles with this wall, this ball and that curd. I fancy I'll have to search each one of you scraps in turn and so on. If you must act all cat lazy and dog loyal, you'd have to be treated like mangy animals too. Cats, he mutters. Dogs. Animals. And with a facial expression, which looks fairly grotesque, the authoritative teacher goes from desk to desk, whilst he fiddles with his paper dockets, whilst he fiddles with his flag, empties each child's bag, and empties each child's trouser pockets. With just one place left to look, he walks past this fire and sees this book, which is a blaze, a light and a flame. His simmering anger comes to a boil, he spits the lava which fizzes like oil, and he swishes his rattlewood cane. Either own up to your crime, he yells and howls as he turns insane, or sally forth with who committed it, and so on, otherwise you'll all be caned. Don't you think you're here for what they call a joy day? We know clipsing and calling in my classroom. How very dare ye. Your pig-headedness amazes me. You do nothing but make haycocks out of your lives, act a fool. Tell me who you suspect. I demand it. Speak out, boy, speak up, when always suspect someone. Clipsing, he mutters. Pigs. Acocks. Alfred is tempted to concede, as his friends start to bleed, at the hands of his rattlewood cane, which slices their skins, pierces their shins, and fills them with hellish pain. It was Alfred, sir, the snotty-nosed scamp repeats again and again. It was Alfred, sir, it was Alfred, sir, it was Alfred. Alfred wishes that he had stood up to confess, as his friend becomes a teary-eyed mess, before his teacher beckons him forward, before his teacher grabs Alfred's collar and lifts his cane above his scholar like a soldier with a sword. The authoritative teacher flashes rose ruby and red as he grips hold of Alfred's head, bends Alfred over and canes Alfred's rear, before he swishes his cane ten times, mutters carrots, criminals, crimes, and yanks at Alfred's left ear. He hits Alfred's palm with the sole of his shoe, which covers Alfred in blisters which are blue and blood which is shiny red. He starts to swear as Alfred pants for air, and shakes his hairy head. Alfred would love to scream and he would love to shout. He would love to cry out, whoop, whimper and wail. But his mouth is being covered, pressed and choked. He's being poked and he's turning pale. So he can only manage with a strangled croak. His sweat covers him in a sticky soak and his body starts to jerk as he is bent over this drum and as he is caned on his bum whilst his teacher goes berserk. This ought to be a lesson to you. The authority teacher groans and moans with his twisted sort of smirk. To all of you, let it teach you that the might of the British Empire is always right, and so on. Many a chap's put his prospects in others, like ye lot just did, and it never ends well. Never. Lessons, he mutters. Empire. Prospects. Each slap, slash and smack during this vicious attack make Alfred feel more bleak. But they help him to manage his inner urges and his emotive surges, which evolve towards a peak. But Alfred is ready to grow, let his maturity show and develop his physique. Just not here, anywhere near, or any time this week.